Hello, people. Good morning. Good morning again. Good morning. Ready for the third and last day of our annual conference? Come on. OK, thank you. So as we did on the first day and yesterday, please give a big hello to the people that are, that are um, not in this audience, but somewhere in the globe. And turn up to the camera and say hello. Thank you very much. Now, Lucy is, will be with us for 60 minutes. Thank you. The floor is yours, Lucy. Thank, Thank you. you. Is this working? Testing one, two, three? Yep. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, <laughs> it's, I didn't expect to see so many people here at this hour on a Sunday morning, I must say. Um, so how are you? We ask that question every day. How many times a day, do you think? Have you ever thought how many times you ask that question? Do you ever actually wait for a response? Let's be honest. Okay, so the question is, when you ask how are you, how are you really? Have you thought about or are you aware of the emotions that you go through on a daily basis? Now, is this working? No, it would have to be on to work. Right, so... We're talking about, you'll see EI from now on, which is emotional intelligence. So what is it? Why is it important not only in the classroom, but especially in the workplace, okay, with your peers, but also at home? Okay. Um, and also some activities. Unfortunately, one hour will not permit me to do the 50 activities I have on emotional intelligence for the, all the different, but we'll try a few which are easier to do in an um, auditorium type setting. So what is it? Really being smarter about your feelings, knowing and being aware of the emotions that you are going through, and also using those emotions to feed into the actions that you're about to take. And perhaps sometimes those emotions shouldn't feed into the actions that you're about to take. Um, I've always been very cautious when I'm angry and I write something, I don't send it. If I write an email when I'm angry, I do not send it. I save it for the next day. And then I reread it and see if I'm as violent as I was the day before, and you do really need to be cautious of what your actions, what your emotions make you do, um, and the effect of those emotions around you. Now, the activities I have, the 50 activities work all of these areas. Of course, I am not going to have time to work all of these areas with you today, um, but it works your self-awareness, so being aware <clears throat> of what you're feeling and trying to control that emotion. Um, as many speakers who are perhaps here today will know that when you're up here, you're nervous as hell, but you look like you're so calm. Okay, so it, it's, it's, it's learning to control those emotions. Empathy, which is such an important emotion. Um, uh, social expertness, so in your surroundings, are you aware of a colleague who might not be going through the greatest time at the moment and hasn't said anything? Um, sometimes these things, because we're so busy with our lives, we tend to get involved with what's around us and not notice um, these, these issues. Then your own personal influence on those around you but also the mastery of vision. So visualizing, I always use a technique which is visualizing success. I'm actually doing a, a course with a high performance coach at the moment, and she uses the technique of visualization. So visualizing a happy classroom, for example. But how are you going to master that visualization? What do you have to put in place to get to that end result? Okay, so I'm going to read some words, okay? You need a piece of paper and a pen. And I want you to write down the words that you associate to yourself, okay? 
So for example, I'm going to read about 12. Just write down the words that you identify with, okay? Bossy, demanding, ambitious, strong-willed, easily distracted, sociable, persuasive, glib, good listener, slow, passive, predictable, fussy, systematic, perfectionist, and careful. Okay? Careful is the last one. Now, glib is somebody who's confident, but perhaps says things without thinking, okay? Um, which will give you an idea of more or less where it falls in that category. I'm sure you all know one. Um, I'm going to give you the lists here of which ones are in the low emotional intelligence and the ones that are the high emotional intelligence. See where you fit in. Okay, who has more in the low? Nobody's going to admit it. <laughs> okay, but even if you have in the high, if you're mainly in the high, there's still fine tuning to be done. Okay? So, I will make these available to you. So if you need, I will happily share these slides with you. No problem whatsoever. A lot of this talk is based on the work of six seconds dot. Or it's an organization called Six Seconds. And you'll understand why it's called Six Seconds in a minute. How many times have people said to you, you know, don't make a decision with your, with your heart, make it with your head? How many times have you heard that in life? Many. The problem is, you can't separate the two. They go hand in hand. And why do they go hand in hand? Because the chemical reactions in your brain are what stimulate your emotions. And then that is a, a cycle, but I'll explain, I'll get to that in a minute. Antonio Damasio, who you probably know very well, um, was the first person who basically said, you know, you can't untie the two. And the thing is, very often, we do make decisions, and sometimes rash decisions, because we don't stop to reflect. Now, with emotional intelligence, you don't have to go to a course to learn about emotional intelligence. You basically have to train yourself, and it's something that you can do anytime, anywhere. You can be stuck in traffic, and you can be training your emotional intelligence. I'm going to ask you to do the body, mind, heart scan, okay? So just focus on this, you're all on yourself, okay? So body, what are you experiencing physically right now? Hangover from last night's dinner. <laughs> okay, what are you experiencing physically? That's the body, then the mind. What kind of thinking are you doing? Is it positive? Is it negative? So thinking, what are you thinking? What type of thinking are you doing? Are you focused? Are you distracted? Are you evaluating? Are you observing? So thinking about the thinking process and what kind of feelings do you have? So imagine you're sitting in traffic or you're sitting on the metro and you do this body, mind, heart scan. So body, what are you feeling physically? What are you thinking? Okay. And what are you feeling? And this is something you can train yourself to do to raise your own self-awareness of your emotional intelligence. And it's something that is so easy to do on a regular basis 
any time, anywhere. And you'll notice after you've done it a few times, you start to get into the hang of it and you really start to hone in at any particular time. You could be in a meeting, you start feeling and understanding your emotions, what you're going through physically. Very often in, in, a, in a meeting, my feeling is boredom, but alas, we have to go through them. Um, so being aware of these things. So this is the body, mind, and heart scan. Now, do you know how long it takes a chemical emotion to go through your whole body? Anybody want to give it a try? Six seconds. Six seconds is how long it takes an emotional chemical to travel through your body. Now, <clears throat> what happens is you, they, the, the chemicals are, are produced. It goes through your pituitary gland and then spreads through your bloodstream to every living cell in your body. Now, imagine... <clears throat> That emotion, or that chemical emotion, is a negative one constantly. What effect do you think it will have on your body? There's very much the saying, a healthy body is a healthy mind, but a healthy mind is also a healthy body. Okay? And very often we forget the other way around. Um, So every emotional reaction you have has a chemical reaction in your soul. How many times have you heard people say to you, oh, don't worry, it's just going to make you sick. Stop worrying, it's going to make you sick. And it literally does. Worrying is probably one of the most, what's the word I want? Um, damaging. Um, emotions you can have because very often when you worry you very often worry without cause because there's always a solution um, and when there isn't what can you do about it <clears throat> so it, it is very very damaging worry but there are other emotions all the negative emotions will have a chemical reaction on your soul on your cells I was talking to somebody yesterday who said to me when you give a compliment to someone that you release uh, a chemical reaction in your body which stays with you for a few days. If you release a negative one or you scream at somebody, it stays with you for weeks. Okay, so just being aware of these things and, and trying to realize that everything we do or say to others doesn't just have an impact on them but has an impact on every living cell in our body. Would you agree? They are. They are extremely contagious. Um, now, emotions are an instant channel of communication. And very often you can see it by looking at people's faces, listening to the tones of their voices. Um, and, very, and sometimes we need to process this data fairly quickly, depending on the situation. Now, we have, and our emotions are particularly contagious to those who are near us, and we're talking about your family, you know, parents, children, but your students. I think Neil mentioned this in his talk, is if you go in with a positive attitude, you're going to reflect and you're going to get the same sort of, if you go in with a negative and an aggressive one, you're going to get the same reaction from your students. Now, um, I want you to think of individually an emotion. Just select an emotion. Got it? I want you, as you're now going to become an actor or a director, okay? And I want you to stand up, please. 
you're ready to do all your acting. <laughs> okay, so now, as an actor or as a director, I want you to imagine yourself exhibiting the feeling that you have chosen, okay? And I want you to stand and move according to the feeling and the emotion you have chosen. Okay, with the person next to you, face each other and try and exhibit and, you need the, and your partner needs to try and identify what it is. <laughs> You're happy. That was all the shopping. <laughs> I see some budding actors here. I see some budding actors. Right, thank you. You know, I could see a lot of people here actually taking on a role in, in the acting field. As teachers, we act all the time, don't we? We're in front of an audience, so it makes it pretty natural. But, you know, thinking of a, a feeling, and this, again, you can do in a, in, while you're stuck in traffic or on the metro or just sitting at home on your sofa, thinking of a feeling, how it's uh, physically demonstrated either by standing by somebody, they, were you bored, the lady next to you? You were sitting there going, what was your feeling? Oh, uh, you're worried. She was going, well, when I saw you, you weren't smiling, so I thought maybe you were panicking there. I don't know what he was saying to you, but <laughs> that's a different story. Okay, so... Again, this is something you can do with students to make them aware that we all have different feelings, we all have different emotions, and we need to be able to deal with that. Um, I had a situation with one of my students. She was very, very talkative. She'd interrupt uh, when the others were talking, and all she really needed was attention because she'd had issues at home. And what happened in the class is the other students used to tease her. So I called those students aside and I spoke to them and I said, look, um, you're being very selfish. Um, and I explained the reasons. I said, you need to think of others before you, you start making these, these comments and think about the process that other people might be going through. And, you know, it's like it's, um, Neil said, as teenagers, their brains are still developing. So sometimes you really have to draw their attention to these things. But from that lesson on, their whole attitude towards her changed. They started inviting her to be part of their group. So it's just a matter of raising awareness, and that's so, so important. Because it is very, very true that you will have an impact on the person next to you. And what you do and your emotions, when you are looking at people and, and having those reactions, Albert was... <laughs> um, you, you tend to have that immediate reaction on, on somebody else. So be very, very cautious of... I love that. Okay. So how are you going to infect the others at work today. Um, and this is something that we could think about every morning. You know, what I'm going to do is going to have effect on those around me. Um, how am I going to affect? Am I going to affect them in a positive way? Or am I going to make it negative for them, which will in turn make it negative for me? Okay. I just want to share with you a video of how behaviors and emotions affect those around you. You may have seen this, but it's one of the most beautiful videos I've ever seen.
าจะได้อะไรถ้าเขาทำแบบนี้ทุกวันจะไม่ได้อะไรเลยไม่ได้รวยขึ้นไม่ได้ออกทีวีไม่มีใครรู้จักไม่ได้มีชื่อเสียงที่มากขึ้นสิ่งที่เขาได้คือได้แค่ความรู้สึกได้เห็นความสุขได้เข้าใจได้ความรักในสิ่งที่เงินซื้อไม่ได้ได้โลกที่สวยงามกว่าเดิมในชีวิตคุณอะไรคือสิ่งที่คุณต้องการมากที่สุดไทยประกันชีวิตเชื่อในความดี Right so that's His emotions lead to his actions, and his actions lead to what he gets back. So this, it's, just, it's such a beautiful video of how our emotions transform into actions and can actually have a huge impact on the lives of others. Um, some say that we are born with a deep... Well, a predisposition to either be optimists or pessimists. However, being an optimist can be learned, and I'm living proof of that. Actually, um, I used to be, as a teenager, as most teenagers are, quite pessimistic about everything. You know, life was terrible, and life was doing me a, a, a rough deal. And you know, it's a typical teenage thing you go through. Um, and now. As they say, you get older and you get wiser. And I thank and I start the day being grateful for everything I have, despite difficulties. We all have difficulties, but we have so much to be grateful for, and that creates optimism and creates you to start the day on a good footing. And it's so so important. Apart from the fact that I have a little dog that's a terror, so there's no way I can wake up in a bad mood because. He's just pure love and pure joy, so I have to wake up happy. Um, but optimism is learned, and, and we can't confuse optimism with positive thinking and thinking there's no problems. Optimism is facing those problems and dealing with them. Now, one of the ways to do it, and if you get yourself into the routine of doing it, is having just jotting down the problem and jotting down the solutions. And then deciding on those solution, which is the best option. Okay, one of the things that has really shocked me over the last two or three months was the number of teenagers who have gone missing, or have run away from home, and unfortunately some have ended up in the worst case scenario. And it really concerns me that these teenagers do not think of solutions. Every problem has a solution. Um, it might not have an immediate solution, but there will be one. And you need to um, 
a, a problem shared is a problem halved, hopefully. Um, and and these, these teenagers, which is normally the age group that I work with, um, don't look for those solutions. But again, it comes back to the talk I did earlier in, um, in the conference, which is the critical thinking, looking at things from different viewpoints. They seem to have stunted and, and cannot do that. So this is a great way of helping them and helping yourselves deal with, with solutions. When I have a problem, I write what the problem is, and I think of all the possible solutions and then decide, well, this one's not going to work, cross it out, and, and reduce it to one of the options. Um, however, you know, you'll see um, in the next video that perhaps a solution is not available right now. It doesn't mean there won't be one. And this is what we need to train our students and ourselves to realize. And I'm just going to show you this video, which always makes me laugh every time I see it. And I'd like to share it with you. Like that, I tried dealing with it internally. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a beautiful slide. When followed in life, I guarantee you, life will be different. I guarantee you, if this is applied in life, we can have peaceful nights sleep. Here it is. Do you have a problem in life? No? Then why worry? Do you have a problem in life? Yes. Can you do something about it? Yes. Then why worry? <laughs> do you have a problem in life? Yes. Can you do something about it? No. Then why worry? <laughs> Isn't it? Isn't it? Why worry? Why are we constantly Why are we constantly bogging our minds down with anxiety? Anxiety that is just absolutely not allowing us to have peace of mind. Um, this is Guru Gopal. He, I, I, I watch a lot of his talks. He's really funny. He has a brilliant sense of humor. Um, and, that, and that's basically it. Worry is one of the most debilitating emotions we can have. And if you have a solution, why worry? If you don't have a solution, you can't do anything about it right now, so you shouldn't be worrying either. I'll give you a perfect example. About three or four years ago, I had a scare with cancer and my doctors made me do a biopsy. And I, and I went and I did the biopsy. Everyone around me was freaking out. Oh, you know? And I said, if I have it, I have it. I deal with it. What can I do? You know, it's life. And, and everybody was just panicking. I'm going, relax. I'm having to calm everybody else down. And, 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 they, and I said, there's nothing we can do, so why should I worry about something that is not in my control? Um, so it's, it's being aware of these things and trying to avoid those things affecting your inner peace. It's like you said, this is your inner peace and you cannot let something that is not in your control affect it. And even worse is let somebody external to you through their anger and their emotions affect your inner peace. That you should never allow that to happen. You're too special and you need to look after every living cell in your body. And that's really important. Okay, so. Our brains are wired for empathy. It is innate in every human being. Um, I'll give you an example. If somebody next to you yawns, what happens? <laughs> if you have a little baby in front of you, and you're goochie, 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 what normally happens to the baby if you're smiling and you're playing with them? They smile right back at you. So we have what are called mirror neurons. Mirror neurons. So the emotions that we are receiving, or that we are sending out are normally the ones you get back. Now, I think it was Neil that mentioned that you need, why is it that with some teachers, some students misbehave, and with others, 
They can get them to do everything they want. It comes back to this. Because if you empathize with the student, what normally happens is you gain their respect. And once you've gained, and one of, I, f I love teaching teenagers. People say to me, teenagers. It is the most challenging age group to teach. But when you win them over, it is the most rewarding. Um, so very often, when we're in a classroom and we're getting this retaliation, it's because we've gone in with that emotion of, we're ready for combat. You know, this, this is my class from hell. Um, so, and I've had one of those. I'll explain how I got over it, but I've had one of those. Um, and we do, we go in already with that predisposition of, they're going to give me hell today. Um, so we need to look at it. It's called, this activity is called radical respect, okay? Um, and you need to look at it. Is it a fact or is it a relationship issue? So what is happening? Is it what you understand as factual or is it something that can be changed by a change of emotions in the relationship? Okay, so you can't do this because you don't have your class in front of you. But next time you go into a class that you have difficulties with, um, think of it. Is it really true that this student is really terrible and he makes my life hell and he's this and he's that? And, or is it something that I need to change in order to get that mirror neuron working? Um, and you need to practice it. Um, and very often, it's human nature. Um, I'm as guilty as anybody here. You have your students who give you hell, and you have your good students, and you tend to focus in your classroom on the better ones because you need to get the work done. You cannot be focusing on the negativity, and you need to get your lesson out of the way. Um, but very often, we don't give importance where importance is due. Um, you can look at this, this from your student's point of view. You need a pen and a paper now. Or you can look at it from peers in your staff room. It's entirely up to you how, to, how you look at it. Okay? I want you to draw between the two of you a big six on a page. Okay? Just one of you draws a big six on the page. Okay? Now, I want you to place, so for example, you've drawn the six like that, right? I want you to place it in front of you, so you're looking at it from different perspectives. Okay, so what do you see? What does one of you see? A nine. The other one sees a? What are you looking at? Exactly the same thing. Okay. Be cautious that you're not putting yourself above somebody else's emotions and thoughts because they're looking at the problem in a completely different way to you does not mean they are not right. Okay. This, this activity was done to me by a teacher and I have never, ever forgotten that lesson. And all it is is a six. And, and you're looking at exactly the same thing and seeing two different sides of the coin. So be cautious that you are not holding yourself above somebody else. And that's important because, again, that leads to emotions that are unnecessary and can you know, cause conflict within the workplace or within the classroom. This is an importance gauge. So coming, continuing from what I, I said, you write the names here of either students or peers, depends how you want to look at it. And within the classroom, you think about, if, if you're doing students, you are the fuel of importance for that person. How much fuel do you give each of your students? 
or how much fuel do you give each of your peers in terms of importance? Have you thought about it? Now, importance, giving somebody or holding somebody at the same level as you is very, very important to create empathy, to create a connection, and to create respect. This is called the importance gauge, and it's activity where you look at either the peer, this is for peers in the workplace, but I look at it from my students' point of view. You can adapt it. And I think, you know, how much importance am I giving Zhuang? And how much importance am I giving Joanna? And very often, if you do it and you're completely sincere with yourself, you will find that you're giving more importance to the ones who don't give you trouble in the classroom. Now, is that mirror neurons at work? Or is it your lack of self-awareness of how you are behaving in the classroom? This is a great way to gauge it. You can then go on and develop it further. So, you know, what could you do? What specific ways for one, somebody whose fuel level in terms of importance is low for one of your students or your peers, what could you do to increase that level of importance? Within the classroom, within the staff room, at home. Okay? So what could you contribute to their sense of importance. Okay. I am going to ask you to do, I want you to select, I'm going to do this as a classroom activity, I want you to select three students in one of your classes, just three, okay? And I want you to do the fuel gauge for each one. Go, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes. Just three of your students. Done? Now I'd like you to think of three of your peers. Slightly different. The fuel of importance is perhaps a little lower, which is scary as you work with these people every day. Okay, so three of your peers now. Now, with the person next to you, I'd like you to discuss these statements or these questions. With the person next to you, what could you do okay, to contribute to that person's sense of importance, particularly if they're running on low? And okay, how could you take this a step further to improve those relationships? Go on. I'll give you a minute, no more.
30 seconds. Right. Okay, I'm not going to focus and ask you to give feedback on peers, okay? But I did want to raise your awareness of the importance you give your peers because the importance you give your peers in the staff room will have an immediate impact on how you feel in that classroom. Um, so creating a better environment is always so much easier than going to work in a environment where you feel happy, you get on with your colleagues, um, then going to somewhere where you're going to feel stressed, unhappy, um, and then you make decisions. Now, in terms of your students, anybody here who had students running almost on empty in terms of importance? I mean, we have to be honest, sometimes we do do that to our students. Um, but what could you do to elevate their importance levels, for example? Sorry? Private conversation. Show you care. What else? What else? Smile. Remember the mirror neurons? Emphasize something good. Any little effort that the student makes, no matter how small, needs to be celebrated. Okay. Now, um, empathy and respect. I'm glad somebody mentioned a private talk because I'm going to give you an example of my student from hell. My lesson was on a Wednesday afternoon at half past four, and I had these students for one and a half hours. It was the most disruptive, and I literally felt sick before walking into that class every single Wednesday. Why? Because I had a child in there, my <laughs> lovely Pedro, and I mean lovely, not sarcastically now, um, who perhaps was the most disruptive kid I have ever, ever come across as a teacher in my 20 years of teaching. He would stand up, walk across the room, throw things at other kids. This, you're talking about 13, 14-year-olds. You're not talking about little ones. <clears throat> he would burst out speaking Portuguese when he knew that the rule was English and English only, and he would defy everything I said in the classroom. And I called him aside at the end of a lesson. I said, look, Pedro, I said, I'm going to call your parents and I, I need to speak to somebody about your behavior. And he said, call them. I said, all right. And I did. To find out, after an hour and a half of talking, well, not really talking to his mother, his mother cried in front of me for an hour and a half, um, that her husband had passed away a year earlier. She still hadn't gotten over it, and she still kept taking out the emotions on Pedro. And the year before that, he was bedridden at home, and Pedro was the one who looked after him. That has to affect any 12, 13-year-old. So my attitude to that class changed from one day to the next, but so did Pedro. And a child who defied me for the first term almost was the child who, after leaving, came back to visit. So very often, not understanding and not empathizing, and we don't empathize sometimes because we don't find out what's behind the behavior and the emotions that are in that classroom. 
And I think it was Chaz that said, when they come into the classroom, they come in with baggage. Uh, I didn't understand how much baggage Pedro had, because this was a kid who, before he went to school, had to deal with his dad's medication and all that. And while his mother, who had a restaurant, when he got home after school, he's the one who dealt with his dad, who was bedridden. So this has to have an enormous effect on this child's um, behavior. Um, but once I understood that, and he understood that I respected him for who he was, he changed. And I don't know if he changed because I changed, or because I had shown them the respect that he deserved for everything he had gone through. So sometimes it's understanding what's behind. They're not just being pests. They're not just being, you know, troublemakers. There might be something underlying that behavior that we haven't figured out yet, okay? So despite the trouble that Pedro gave me, he was probably in teaching one of my greatest gifts. He taught me to understand my students before making any prejudiced decision against them. So again, thinking about how your emotions, because I was already going in, you know, anxious and, and ready for a battle every time I went into that classroom. Um, and then I had to talk to his peers and explain the situation. Of course, I didn't go into great detail, but then they also understood his behavior, and their behavior towards him also changed. So it became such a nice class after that. And every child, regardless in your class, regardless of what they do or how they behave and what they say to you, are always a gift. And I would like you to think of, again, three students in your class, not necessarily the best, okay? Just think about those three students and what they bring to the class. I do believe every student that crosses our path is a gift. We learn from every single one. So I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes to just do this activity, and then we'll share. <clears throat> you can work with the person next to you if you wish. You're all very quiet. One more minute. Right, okay, so, anybody care to share um, what they've written down about, no names of course, but the students that you have selected? Hello? Anybody want to talk about the three students they've selected and what they bring to the classroom? 
You're still working on it. Microphone. Oh, you get to sing. <laughs> this gentleman, yeah. It's fine. Guillermo, uh, I said it, humor, often unintentional, but and enthusiasm. Okay. <laughs> they always bring something, and, and we need to recognize it. Anybody else want to share anything? what your students, perhaps the, some of the most troublesome, bring to the classroom. I certainly have learnt a lot of lessons from perhaps the more troublesome than the ones who always behave. Yes. Okay. So, regardless of how they behave, the idea of this is for you to look at your students and see, students, you can do this for peers as well. Okay, what gifts do peers bring? This is actually a really good activity for um, a teacher's room and, and for school leaders, really, because leaders who are empathetic very often are the most liked leaders. And it's actually um, Six Seconds did a research on banks and the banks that were most empathetic and... and did good in the social were the ones who attracted the most investment. So that goodness always comes back. And we do need to acknowledge, even though we might have issues with a particular student, they might bring in humor into the classroom, not always when we want it, but we need to, to treasure that because humor is a good thing. Humor is a good thing. Um, so. Take every positive thing that your students have to bring into the classroom and work with it, because it will work. Anybody here do volunteer work? Apart from Neil, which I know, okay. Would you agree with the following statement? You get a lot back more from them than you give, without a doubt. I work um, with the homeless, and I work with an animal association. And the f I've been doing homeless duty now for many, many years, over 10 years. Uh, when I started, um, the first night, I cried all the way home um, because it was a reality that I was no, I had no idea I had no idea. Um, over the years, you start to create empathy and respect from those who I call my street friends. Um, and I go out at least once a month, um, and, or I do home duty with families who are needy. And I always say, I come back so much richer. I come home so much richer than when I left. And it's an incredible, incredible feeling. My whole attitude to life changed the moment I started doing volunteer work with the homeless because I sometimes go out on nights that are, like today, rainy, cold, and I get home and I think, I've never treasured my bed more than when I get home on those nights. And I think how blessed I am despite all my problems. And you get so much love and so much respect and so much admiration for, from these people who, even though we go out and we take food, that's the last thing they really want from us. They need, what they really need is somebody to listen and to respect and not ignore them if they're sitting in the street, which is what most people do. And it's quite sad. Um, and altruism, without a doubt, changes the whole way you view life. Um, and you're a lot more grateful for everything 
good that happens in your life and, and the people you have around me. I am so, so blessed. And I, and I thank the Lord every day for that. I am so blessed and I'm so privileged with the work I do, the people I know, my family, everything. And that gives me a positive attitude in life. And people very often say to me, you know, you're always running around and you never stop. And, you know, how do you keep up the energy? How do you stay positive? I have no other way to see life. People say to me, is the, half, is the glass half full or half empty? The glass is always full. Half of water, half of air. The glass is always full. So keeping in mind that emotional intelligence is something interior, it's something that you can work everywhere and any time. It's something that's very personal to you. I'm quite happy to share the activities I have. There are a lot of them, and ideally they should be done in group. But if you want to really train the different parts of emotional intelligence, send me an email, and I'm very, very happy to share um, I'll share the slides with you, but I'm also happy to share the worksheets that will help you um, enhance your emotional intelligence. So basically, you need to know yourself. You need to enhance your emotional literacy. You know those lists that I showed you, low and high? You need to work on the high ones. You need to recognize patterns of behavior. So if you go into a staff room and somebody says something to you, how do you react? What are your emotions? How can you control those? Um, also, navigate emotions. Okay? Choose yourself. You can choose to be optimistic. As, as you saw, optimistic, optimism is learnt, but it's a process you have to go through. It doesn't happen naturally. And then give yourself, increase your empathy, okay? Because the minute you increase your empathy, you gain respect, okay? And pursue noble goals, if you have the time. But I always say, I find the time. Even though I'm running around all the time, I actually had the, the project leader on the phone to me yesterday. She says, are you going to be around in May? I said, just put me down. If I'm around, I'm around. <laughs> so irrelevant of where I, I'm really, really busy, that night I am 100% focused on the people on the street. I forget work, I forget family, I forget everything. I'm there 100% for them, and that's the way it has to be. So, there are a lot of these courses for leaders and heads of schools, etc., which are so, so important that they have the right emotional intelligence because they're dealing in a social environment. Um, they're dealing with teachers, they're dealing with students. It's a lot of emotions to, 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 um, to deal with and to manage. But most importantly, increased personal well-being, which is, you know, what we strive for all the time because if you're okay, you're going to help those around you be okay. I don't know how many of you stayed to see the film on Friday night, but you'll notice that there's a lot more working on emotional intelligence and critical thinking and creativity than there is on IQ. Okay. It's your emotional intelligence which will allow you to control and manage your emotions and create the respect within the environment to help you um, get where you want to go without stepping on anyone's toes. It's phenomenal what emotional intelligence can achieve in, in, in big companies like this. Imagine in your environment at home, your environment in the workplace, and your environment in the classroom. Okay. 
Think carefully how you start each day. If you had a little dog like mine, you could never start on a bad day. <laughs> okay. Learn to master yourself. You master your emotions. It's so, so important in all aspects of life. Thank you for listening. Have a good day, everyone. <laughs>